Welcome to the Pelican Pod, a podcast showcasing our talented authors and illustrators and the books they create. We'll be exploring the moments in history that inspire our books and the culture that makes them unique. This is Antoinette D. Alteris, PR and Marketing Director, and your host for the series. Today on the Pelican Podcast, we have two of our favorite people, author Carol Allen, who is Leah Chase's biographer, and chef Edgar Duke Chase IV, Leah Chase's grandson. Welcome back to the Pelican Podcast. As you know, it's Black History Month, and we're very excited today to have two guests on our program. Today, we're talking with Carol Allen, who is Leah Chase's biographer and has a second book on a young Leah Chase coming out very soon this spring, and also her grandson, who has stepped into her footsteps with the restaurant. Edgar Duke Chase is coming in to be at the airport with the restaurant, and then also the new services at the restaurant on Orleans that we've come to love. So welcome to both of you. Thank you. Thank you. Carol, this new project that you're doing is pretty amazing. Uh, we realize that it's it's a little sad to be talking about Leah in the past, uh, no longer with us, but this this project, you worked with her through the end of her life. Tell us a little bit about it. Well, it's true. This is a project that Leah and I collaborated on, um, and you go, you folks gave me six months to finish it, and had I not written the prior biography, there's no way I could have done it. But I had a lot of information from the first book, and then meeting with Leah to bring it up to speed to actually her childhood, getting more information about that, because I wanted this book to be for young readers. I think that she's one of the most motivational human beings I've ever met in my life. And I think young girls need to know more about her. So that's, uh, we had several interviews and um, we were working on it. And I remember the last conversation Leah and I had really, she was in the hospital and uh, she told my sister, who was one of her nurses, that I, she would like me to come to see her, so I did. And one of her questions was, when is the book coming out? <laughs> so uh, We all have that question. Yeah, Leah was never one to forget anything. She was one of the most astute women for her age, for, for any age, but to be 96. Right. Yeah, so it was a great project. One of the things that I noticed when I was reading through this book was how articulate you she was and you are in bringing those reminiscences to life. Tell me some of the things that you learned about her that we're going to find in this book. Well, I think key to this, and I, I must say one of the greatest blessings in my life was to be able to work with Leah on her biography. Um, we spent three years together. Uh, we became not only colleagues on the book, but good friends. Um, she visited me in France. She got to know my family, I got to know her family. And so when I moved back to New Orleans in 2008, I just went right back to Leah, to see Leah. And we had a tradition of going to a brand new restaurant, our new opening restaurant in town um, on her birthday. And that was great because I would call and make the reservation and I would say, and tell the chef, I'm bringing Miss Leah Chase and <laughs> it's her birthday. And so it was red carpet from the minute the car drove up until we walked out that night. And we did that until her health got to the point that she just really preferred not going out at night. But all of the time we spent together, I learned her voice. That's what we writers say, you know, put it in your voice or put it in her voice. I kind of learned how she would say things, and she's got a, had a wicked sense of humor. Yes. And I wanted that to come out in this book. So even though she's talking to God, she's she's got a sense of humor talking to God. And her children all read the manuscript. And I made a comment to Duke's dad, Edgar III. I said, Dookie, do you think I'm, I'm being uh, ir um, disrespectful? with this sense of humor. 
And he said to me, if God didn't have a sense of humor, I wouldn't have been born. <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. I think that's true about the book and that it's very, I heard her talking. I mean, I've, I've known her for a while too, but I heard her talking in the book. It, it was very, you achieved exactly that. Oh, thank it you. sounds as if she's there talking to you. And I, um, we were talking a little bit earlier before we started recording about my interns that I have interns for Pelican and I've taken them for the last eight years every summer to meet her. That was the big treat to go to the restaurant and then to meet her. And the things that she said to them, I can read it right in the book. There are moments in there where the same advice came through. Pay attention to yourself. Don't let other people take advantage of you. Don't lie. Work hard. All these things that she repeated are there in the book. And I think that's a, a wonderful achievement right. for you and a, a wonderful testament and sort of a a way for us to continue passing this on. Now, your first book was written in 2002. You said it took three years, and that was a true biography of her for adults. Talk a little bit about that. Oh, what a wonderful project. Um, and people ask me, started asking me after we lost Leah, how did you ever write her biography? I said, I asked. Right. Um, my ex-husband and I were having dinner at the restaurant one night. It was when the restaurant was opened up at night. And it was right after she had been given the Loving Cup Award. And she had a habit of coming and sitting at the table with us when we were at the restaurant. And we were talking. And I said, Leah, who's writing your story? And she threw her head back and laughed. And she said, well, that would be a story to tell. And bing, 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 and the you know, brain is turning. So on our way home that night, we had a home in the French Quarter. I said to my ex-husband, I said, I want to tell you that I am going to talk to Leah about possibly writing her biography. And if she will let me do that, that means I'm going to have to be coming back and forth from France. We were living in France to New Orleans to do the research and the groundwork. And then I can take it home and work on the book there. And he said, go for it. So I called her and I made an appointment to go out and see her. And I took um, an article I had written about Ernie Gaines, which had been published in Associated Writers. And I took her something else and I went to meet her and I said, Leah, and I all my life I've called her Leah. I've never called her Miss Chase or Miss Leah. Um, I said, I'm bringing, I would like to work with you on your biography. And I said, I've brought you a couple of things I've written for you to share with your family. And then you can let me know whether you'd like to do this with me. And so she took them and she looked at them and she said, okay, we'll do it. You might get two sentences. And <laughs> literally, that's how it started. And then when, every time I was in town, I'd make appointments. So I'd go interview her and I would interview family members. I would interview friends. Um, get all of my information together. And then I had a wonderful friend who you've also published, Al Kennedy. Right. That when I would get back to Far Paris, if I would find out I was missing something, Al was my... Um, Your surrogate in the city. Well, he was my go-to person. And he would go and interview... For instance, I never was able to uh, interview... Uh, Patrick Taylor. Right. And I really wanted to interview him because of the TOPS program, which he launched in Leah's restaurant. Right. So Al went and interviewed uh, Patrick Taylor for me. So we worked together on some things that I just couldn't do from so far away. So you were just a kid when this with this project with oh, this biography of course. started. Was. There was a whole chapter on the grandchildren. <laughs> yeah. I met with them one day. I, I remember reading that one and, and putting it in context going, wait, who is this now? And so the list of names, I mean, you have a big family. Oh, it's huge. Yes. And most of them work in the restaurant, too. We do. And and all of us grew up in that business. So mm -hmm. we all had to work. That was our beginning job. So whether we stayed there or not, we all had to pay our time in a restaurant. How was it working for your grandmother? Uh, awesome. You know, it's, it's like Carol said, uh, you know, the most inspirational, motivational person, not just because she was my grandmother, but just everything she stood for. Uh, but with that, she showed you it was tough love, right? Right. You wasn't treated any different than any other uh, employee at the restaurant. 
Uh, but I enjoyed every day of it. Uh, I can't imagine disappointing her. It's like, that would be the absolute worst. Because I, I don't I don't envision her in me. I never had a situation where she was disappointed in me. So that was good. But I just have this feeling like she'd be one of those grandmothers that would just be that sad puppy dog face. It's yeah, like, no, she, yeah. she would let you know if you didn't get it right or you wasn't doing right. But she was always one to teach you what you should be doing, right. uh, why you shouldn't have done what you did. Right. Uh, so it was always a place. It was tough race. love. It was a place from love. So you know, you know, if you got called this so and so and so and so, it was coming from from a position of love. But you knew, don't do it. Don't ever don't do, do it, it again. again. Yeah. First time you got away with it. So you did that in two thousand and two. And what was the genesis for this new project with the the middle reader book? I just wanted young people to read about her life. And I came to you all at Pelican and I said, you know what, this needs to be done. It really needs to be done. Young girls particularly need to read about this woman. And um, uh, you all said, let's go with it. Yes, and we did. So Quickly. I got started. I got started. And I can just give you an aside. I had done most of the work with Leah and I took a week off to go and spend a week at my daughter's home to work on it, just to be by myself and work. And the third morning I got up and I wrote everything I had written in three days and I thought, this is the most boring thing I have ever written. And so I got out my computer and started emailing some of my former professors at Vermont College and some of my writing colleagues and I said, how do you get a young person interested in reading about an old lady? And people send me information, but that wasn't what led me to this format. I honestly just kept doing more research online and praying, God, please, you put me here, do this. And that those letters started coming. And, and then I got nervous because of, hey, God, it's me, Margaret, you know right. that one? So I wrote to one of my professors and I said, do you think I can do this? I mean, I'm, I, it's her format. And she said, she doesn't own that. So go for it. And that's where it went. And so the format on this book is in the form of a journal written to God from Leah throughout her life. And it starts with her as a young child, and then it goes up towards the end of her life, right. which, of course, we didn't realize at the time was going to be the end of her life. We all wanted her to live way past 100, but it follows those stories. And so talk about some of the things that you really touched on in this book that you didn't touch on in the biography. Okay. Well, first of all, people should understand Leah did talk to God every, every day. single day. Yes, every day. Did. And Cleo told me one time, she said, we got crucifixes <laughs> in here all over the place. You can't, and, and at the end of her life, I saw there were a whole, a a whole wall. A, a wall of the mope over where she sat, you know, the queen's chair there. But um, so that was something I knew that she did. And um, who knows where the inspiration comes from, but I just figured that when her parents decided they were going to send her to New Orleans, St. Mary's, to come to high school, because there was no Catholic high school around Madisonville, and I thought, golly, you know, she was 12 years old. What a panic that must have been, because it was an incredibly close family. They would basically line up together every Sunday and go to Mass together, and her, fa her father helped her with her homework every night, and... They picked strawberries all the time and gave the best ones to the nuns and the ones that could be shipped to be shipped and kept the bad ones to use at home for his wine or, or, or her mother's desserts. So I thought, well, it's she's got to be afraid. So that was the impetus for the first letter is, you know, God, you've got to help me. They're sending me away to go to school. Right. And clearly she was afraid to go. And then because I knew her life, I mean, I thought about what it would have been like having to wear that uniform, which her mother made, and meeting the nuns, which were not at all like the nuns that she had known back in Madisonville, being scared, it's a new place. Um, and, and, and she felt that, um, she felt a little bit snubbed at St. Mary's because she came from a poor family. Right. And that plays into it. Um, her achievement as a student, she was very smart. She worked hard. She did well. 
And then just things like when President Roosevelt came to the city, I figured, well, they would have had to have taken the kids out to see the president drive by because he was going to Antoine's for lunch. Right. And so played with that a little bit. And then she went back home after she graduated. And all she could do in Madisonville was clean house and do laundry. And so she says, God, surely you didn't put me through St. Mary's to just do this. So she ends up coming back to New Orleans to work. And she's a very attractive woman. Yes, she was. And she loved the the boxing matches. And she um, had a group of friends and they all took care of her. And she would meet one man who would, you know, make a move on her. And her friends would say, oh, no, not him. He does drugs. And then she met Dookie. And so a lot of the, you know, the story takes off with their relationship. And she was, she knew she could never tell her parents that she was dating a man, not only five years younger than her, but a musician. She said, my father would thought musicians weren't worth anything. You know, they didn't work the right way. They didn't get up every morning. So that was difficult for her because they wanted to get married, which of course they ultimately did. Um, I don't know, the stories just wove themselves in. I just had tons of material. I think it's interesting, too, to see, you know, how many other outside pieces have been influenced. And just the fact that you're the first person who wanted to do a biography of her is just insane to me. Because now we look back over the last 20 years and we've seen The Princess Frog and we've seen all these other shows that have incorporated her spirit and tenacity and her character into their programs. We see the inspiration in Treme in the TV show. We've seen all of this stuff and it just boggles my mind that this is only the last 20 years. But the reality is Miss Leah and the Chase family have been influential in the political and social and cultural scene for almost half a century. Oh, probably mm -hmm. more. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I guess, yeah, because we're talking yeah. the 50s and it's 60s. Starting really with voting rights even prior to the civil rights movement. Right. So that's something that comes out in the biography. That's something that comes out in, of course, the new book that's coming in the spring. But it's also something that happens in the restaurant even now because the restaurant still hosts the luncheons, the political luncheons. That's and, correct. Uh, different things. During Essence Fest, that place is crazy. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and, and it still has a community feel and, and a political feel to it. All the you know different meetings that take place uh, Folks still book the private room, come in, anybody's campaigning, they will host their parties there, this, that, and other, because it has such a history, mm -hmm. uh, not only during the civil rights and the voter rights era, but just a sense of community. You know, that's what Dookie Chase is, even way back from the sandwich shop in the lottery days, right? We used to be able to cash uh, African-American checks that had no bank there. Right. My great-grandfather would let them in and we would cash their checks. Uh, but it's it's just that community feel that, that Dookie Chase has. Uh, and I think we're going to continue that legacy to keep it going. The community wants us, needs us there, and we need them to come and see us every Absolutely. day. Absolutely. Now, one of the things that's exciting about what you're doing with the restaurant is that you, you do have plans to have a dinner service mm -hmm. in the future. Mm -hmm. you no, know, not immediately, but we're, you're working towards that. And of course, continuing to have that community there. I think the last time we were there, the mayor's group um, was there talking about young people in education mm -hmm. and they were having a meeting there. And it was really nice to see this combination of both political and cultural leaders there. And one thing a important about the restaurant that you that is touched on in the biography, but also in her cookbooks as she talks is about she never saw colors of people when she had things. And it was a place where during the civil rights movement, there were people of all races in there having these conversations when it was actually illegal. Absolutely. Right. That's that's one of those things that you don't think about now, but if you think about what they were risking to do that. Yeah, and, and you know, for my grandparents, it was always a place of uh, inclusivity. We had to include everyone. That's that's what we were taught. That's how we were growing up. And and, and what goes on now that we're, we're I'm excited about is we'll invite school kids. There's different groups like Silverback mm -hmm. Society where they'll host every Wednesday 
a, a bus from a different school just to expose these kids to the restaurant and the etiquette of how you eat in a restaurant. So each and every Wednesday, there's a different group of uh, elementary students to come in the restaurant. And whether it's Mod Stella or Tracy will go and teach them how to eat, what's the course, where you start with this spoon and this fork and this, that, and the other. And it's really just exposure. That's what that restaurant did for us. It exposed us to so many things, whether it was art, whether it was food, music, uh, just the culture of this city. Right. And, and that's one way we definitely give back is bringing the kids around the neighborhood, around the city who may not have dined in a restaurant uh, just yet, but they get to experience that. That's an amazing thing mm -hmm. to bring back. I know Dillard's has a program now where they do the same thing for the college students, mm -hmm. where they talk about what's the etiquette to sit down? How do you set a table? Right. What should you do in a restaurant? And Carol, maybe we need to have one of those Wednesdays when the school kids are coming. Maybe we need to be there with a book event. That'd be great. And I just made myself a note because I'd like Good Shepherd kids to come too. Awesome. Yeah. We'll, we'll love to have them. That would be amazing. So one of the other things that um, we've been talking about uh, in mentioning this is the other two books and the other two books outside of the biography in the new book are and still i cook which miss leah actually did herself with nina and then the dookie chase cookbook which has been on sale since we were looking at the dates on it i believe 1990 when it first came out and that one was an interesting story in itself because our editor-in-chief nina coy went to the restaurant and sat with miss leah as she made the recipes and recorded what she said about them. So when you look at some of these recipes and, and what she said, you get a picture in these four books of who she was as a person and certainly of the family and what the restaurants meant to everybody. So tell us some of the plans you have for the for the new life of the restaurant. Yeah, so the new life is really a uh, new life, but going back to old, right? We're going back to how my grandmother had it when you were, we had dinner service uh, majority of the week. That's We're doing some renovations and we're getting ready to open up full time for dinner. And it's really just bringing it back to her traditions and her legacy, right? Uh, there may be one or two things added to the menu, but for the most part, it's going back to her menu uh, and making sure we're doing it right. So that's exciting. And I think people expect that. You know, when you're in the restaurant and you hear people coming in and they're telling you all these stories of when they came for their anniversary and their birthday and this one's first communion and on and on and on, that just, it's more inspiration and motivation. So guys, we got to get this back. I mean, this is just, part of the fabric of that community that we have to do. Uh, and that's what I'm most excited about. And that's going to happen fairly soon. There's no specific date yet, but it, it will be coming out pretty soon. That will be very exciting. Now, one of the things that's exciting with the restaurant that, that also happened in mm -hmm. the last year or so is you were at the airport. Yes, yes. So now we have a new airport, but you went into the airport before the renovation was finished, right? Right. So we had a dookie chase in the, I guess we can say the old terminal. And mm -hmm. now we have a restaurant called Liz Kitchen in the new uh, airport. And that's really telling a story and really a tribute to my grandmother's legacy and my grandfather's as well. But when you go in there, you, you see the art, original art. We have a, a mural by Ayo Scott, and then we have a... Uh, a wall that's really original by my cousin Chase Kamada that tells my grandmother's story from start to finish, from the strawberry patch that Carol captured in his book all the way up until, you know, her days at Dookie Chase leading into her kitchen. So it, it really is a reflection of her life in a time stamp uh, through art, through food. Uh, we certainly have a horn up there to represent my grandfather and his big 16 piece band. But one of the my favorite pictures in there, and I know Miss Allen came in and caught it, was a picture of a staircase. And that staircase is for the upstairs dining room that we have at Ducky Chase Restaurant. I That's when about you that talk picture. about yeah. the civil rights, right? That's why those meetings were held in that upstairs dining room. So that when you go in that restaurant and you see that stairway, uh, that's showing that legacy of, of that movement and how much uh, history has happened in that restaurant. And and that location, as I said, we were talking before, but I've, I went to the airport and actually went through security because I was going someplace and 
got to go into the restaurant right after it opened on that new section. And it's amazing. Awesome. Well, thank you. I, thank I was you. really, it's definitely not the old restaurant. Uh -huh. It's not the Orleans restaurant because you've got some fun things on the menu that are a little different. Yes. But there's enough in there to get that feeling. And the art, we didn't even talk about the art in the restaurant. I mean, if, if for no other reason than the art, you have to visit the restaurant on Orleans because her collection of art is amazing. And one of the things that you did, Carol, in the first book is you got Miss Leah to pull out those pictures. And so in that first biography, of, which was done before Katrina in 2003, you had the family pictures in there and we put them on a disc. And then during Katrina, Miss Leah lost all of those pictures. Mm -hmm. So after Katrina, I guess I started working for Pelican in 2008, and it was a real treat for me to be able to give her back that disc of photos because they were doing something for her in the city, mm. and she didn't know they still existed. Mm. Oh, my. And it's the only place they exist because they're gone. Uh, so it was hard when we came to this new book because – there aren't any pictures of her younger because the first pic the first picture that we had was the graduation picture in her cap and gown. And even there, we we tried. Uh, Duke's dad suggested, "Well, why don't we check with St. Mary's? Maybe they've got pictures." Mm -hmm. And yeah. well, St. Mary's lost everything in yeah. Katrina, so they didn't have any photographs either. And we put out a big call. I mean, we went through social media. Does anybody have? So we got a lot of photos of you know the last fifteen years, but yeah. prior to that not so much. So it was exciting to work through the process with the artist to do the image on the front of the new book. Uh, it's sort of her at a desk writing, looking in the mirror, and the mirror is showing the picture of her as an adult, which was fun. But the artwork in the restaurant, so how is, the, how is that art still expanding do you guys are still collecting yes definitely still uh expanding and i think i picked up in as well as a few cousins that that itch or that buzz of getting uh -oh. into collecting there's uh, not a lot of wall space left in there no and I, i'm out of wall space at my house it is a very expensive uh hobby yes uh, uh, collection but uh no, that's something we're going to continue to do. We've been getting ready to uh, play around with some things that's calling a Liz wall in the back dining room where mm -hmm. we have up and coming artists. We can portray their uh, oh, pictures nice. there. Yeah, it's kind of that. going back to the real reason why not only for her love for art, but what she got into collecting art was to showcase African-American right. art all throughout the restaurant. At the time, they couldn't showcase it anywhere else. Right, nowhere else. else. So we're trying to come back to that where is let's have a wall called Leah's Wall and any up and coming uh, artist can put up one or two or three uh, pieces of art that they have and we'll just keep that going. Uh, you know, all the things we're trying to capture her legacy, right. her, what she was all about, what you captured so perfectly in this book and continue that tradition. Uh, cause it's, it is amazing. I mean, every time I read another article or book over again, or watch a special or documentary on my grandmother, I learn something new <laughs> and, and it inspires me more. I'm like, man, I got to get up and do something. I'm, I'm, I'm you know, I feel <laughs> I a certain way a watching this uh, right now and not moving as, <laughs> as she would move. Uh, but that's what's, that's, it's a uh, amazing story. And I'm glad you wrote that book because I think you're right. Everybody needs to read that story, and especially uh, young women and little girls. They need to see that that inspiration uh, and be able to carry themselves with a sense of pride. Because you know, you know, my my grandmother did come from very humble, humble beginnings, uh, and she worked her way through everything. Uh, you know, my father talked about it in one of those documentaries that there was nothing my grandmother couldn't do. Mm -hmm. uh, and there really wasn't. You know, I've seen a, we would go and do these cooking demonstrations of meals at Gala's, right? Feed a thousand people. And they would come in with me and her and Cleo. And these other chefs that have a team of 10 right. people. And they'll look at I've us. I've seen her do They'll that. look at us crazy. Like, how are you going to do it? And she would just roll. Mm -hmm. and, and we would walk in and say, how are we going to do it? But she would she there was nothing she couldn't do uh so it, it's it definitely is an amazing story <laughs> and it and it is a story that you know not only motivates my family but keeps us moving because we have to yeah 
Well, I think that's a perfect ending for our conversation. So the book that's coming out now is A Long Way from the Strawberry Patch, The Life of Leah Chase by Carol Allen with Leah Chase. The original biography is Leah Chase, Listen, I Say Like This. And then the two cookbooks are And Still I Cook by Leah Chase and The Dookie Chase Cookbook by Leah Chase. So once again, thank you to my two guests, Carol Allen, her biographer, and her grandson, Edgar Dookie IV. That's right. Uh, we're so glad that you were able to talk to us, and I hope that you will continue the restaurant and the tradition that she's trained everybody in. Thank you. Thank you very much, Antoinette. It was a pleasure. Thank you. Thank you for listening to The Pelican Pod. We release new episodes every two weeks on YouTube and SoundCloud. If you'd like to read these books and more, visit your local indie bookstore or find them online. The Pelican Pod is brought to you by Pelican Publishing, an imprint of Arcadia Publishing. Recorded and produced by James May. Thank you.